in Taoist tradition, um, they have a concept called Wu Wei. Wu Wei represents effortless action. Um, according to Taoist texts, uh, the Tao Te Ching, one of the verses says that the way does nothing, yet nothing is left undone. This is describing a function of being able to accomplish your goals without forfeiting your rest, without forfeiting your peace in order to achieve that goal. It's doing it in the most efficient way possible in order to maintain your identity, to not sacrifice yourself. And truthfully, getting things done without technically doing anything, it's staying in the flow of the spirit, staying in the flow of energy, staying in the flow of the world, staying in your divine flow so that you're really not exerting any energy or effort on your own. It's the result of the place that you're learning to live from or that you're operating from. Uh, Bruce Lee kind of talked about this and Bruce Lee is really like the greatest martial artist in recorded history <laughs> um, where he would say, be like water. And what he was saying in that is be flexible, adapt as needed, have an end goal, but don't be rigid in how that end goal is achieved. And I believe that concept of be like water fits perfectly into this concept of rest that I'm talking about. If you watch footage of Bruce Lee in combat, you'll see that he stayed in a state of rest. He stayed in a state of focus. Therefore, he was able to fluidly act and react to whatever was coming his way. And it was more it was his ability to maintain that rested state. He was a man that meditated a lot. He really focused more on his internal uh he focused on his internal work just as much as he focused on his physicality. That mentally he maintained that place of focus and rest. Now I've talked about the different roles and functions, um, being the king, the priest, and the prophet, but there's one that functions even higher than the king, and that's the emperor in relation to God's government, in relation to just the governmental structure, that the emperor is the king of kings, and the kings function by joy. So what is this force? What is this demeanor? What is this energy that has the ability to mobilize that which is immobile? Because kings don't move. And that's faith. Faith is one of those things that we hear about a lot, yet it's been uh, so misdefined. It's been misapplied, mispresented, that faith is, is often seen as a bad thing in the scope of intellectual circles. And that's because of what's presented as faith, but not what faith actually is. Uh, biblical text tells us that faith is a substance. Uh, specifically, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Well, that tells you, one, that faith is a substance. It's something that does exist. Well, it's the substance of things hoped for. Well, if it's hoped for, that means it's not here yet. It's the evidence of things not seen. It's not the evidence of things that don't exist. It's the evidence of things that simply are currently unseen. Faith is the ability to connect with your future while still in your present, to connect with the unseen before it becomes seen, to connect with the end result long before it manifests. It's not the, uh, it's not the insanity of hoping for something that does not exist. A great picture of faith is like ordering a pizza <laughs> in that you've put in your order, therefore you're allowed to have a hope and an expectancy on when that should arrive. But if you've never put in an order, you're insane to expect it to pop up. And that's often what religion has taught us to do is to have an expectancy with no connection, no substance connected, just hope. And when things don't work out, we've been taught to blame God and blame ourselves. In reality, what we called faith was simply hope. It was, expecta it was an expectation that wasn't grounded to anything. Therefore, failure was unavoidable. So the emperor is actually the, he's the master of faith. The emperor function is the master of faith. Because the emperor functions out of rest. 
So the the emperor fully de, he fully embodies this effortless action because the emperor himself does nothing. Yet the entire empire is made mobile at the will of the emperor. That whatever the desire is expressed by the emperor, the kings make sure that it goes into effect. He's able to put in motion the things that are immobile. What happens when an immovable object meets an unstoppable force? In this case, the emperor is an immovable object that is also an unstoppable force that puts to action the immovable objects in his domain. And this is something that is in complete opposition to what we're used to doing. In the spirit world, when you're functioning in your imperial identity, when you're functioning by the spirit, rest is the most important state. But when you're functioning under a satanic structure, you're functioning lower than that, you're functioning in the world, you're functioning out of today's systems, work is the most important thing. Religions who function under a satanic structure is focused on your servitude. They're focused on your servanthood. They're focused on what work you can do. They care little about your identity, what you're called to do. They just care if they can put you to work. That the opposite of the function of the spirit is slavery. Where we have people working for the sake of work. Getting very little in return. Convincing the oxen that have been muzzled that they shouldn't expect to eat while they work is become the culture of today's time, which is in complete opposition to God's government. And people, because we're conditioned into that society, have grown accustomed to it. So one of the things that people struggle with when they're embracing their spirituality is finding out that rest is a good thing. That you're not lazy for resting. That you're not... Uh, you're not ineffective because you're rested. You're actually more effective than ever. You're actually in your God state. You're in your spirit state. You're in the right space to be of any good. I've heard the quote before or the phrase before where people are like, uh, they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Well, this is how you're so heavenly minded that you're finally earthly good. Um, which I guess could be the opposite, because when you begin to function from above, you become unusable by the lower world. <laughs> that you no longer fit into a servant role. You no longer fit into that structure. Because the emperor bows to no one. It's the king of kings. So when you're connecting, that that's actually a part of your heavenly identity, that you're born into an imperial family. <laughs> the emperor of heaven is now your placement in the cosmology of creation and beyond creation. Society is built up in a way that keeps us in a state of survival. I have other teachings on this I'll be covering, especially in the school of the empire, but powers that be, and I'll say it that way, have society set up in such a way that people's main frequency is survival. And most people, sadly, do not escape that frequency and end up dying in that frequency. Again, this is the complete opposite of what's actually the will of God, the structure of God, and the nature of God that we're actually supposed to be replicating. And honestly, the structure is intentional to keep us in the opposite. Therefore, we never walk, we never uh, step into our identity. We never step into our calling and we continue to serve and we continue to raise up generations of workers. Uh, John Rockefeller actually said, I want a generation. I want generations of workers, not thinkers. And he got his wish especially in the States. I know I have an international uh, audience, but in the States, John Rockefeller set the stage for what our society is today. He said, I want workers, not thinkers. And so we are workers that don't think. We don't question much that happens. We've given up most of our authority. We've given up most of our identity. 
in order to work because we're kept in a survival state. But I come to tell you that the way out of that is through rest. It's the refusal to play the game. It's the, refru- it's the refusal to live in a survival mentality. Because what happens is when you enter into that rested state, you start to realize your abundance. You begin to realize that everything that you need is within you. Everything that you need is all around you. Whatever needs to be done, you act as a magnet when you're functioning in rest. And it attracts the things that you need. It repels the things that mean to do you harm. And it takes no effort on your part. Because in that state, you're functioning in the emperor's frequency. Where everything you need is taken care of and you don't have to lift a finger. This is the state that people like Elijah stepped into where nature began to feed him. (laughs) In the middle of a famine. So in that, I'll encourage you again that the way to step into that, the way to begin walking in your kingdom identity, your imperial identity, is to start resting. Let go of the things that are causing you stress. Let go of the mentalities that are keeping you in bondage. Realize that the way out of being a survival, a, a survivalist or being a survivor is to live in rest. The more authority you have, the less you do. It's actually a common complaint in the world is how come the people that do all the work make the least money? Yet the people that do the least work have all the money. Well, that's the structure of metaphysics. The more you want, the more you have is determined on how much you realize you have. You get what you resonate with. So if you're living in a state of lack, a frequency of lack, that means that all of your pockets have holes. That means that everything you touch is running out, which means, and let's just say that's not wrong. That means that you have a a society, a structure, a system built around the idea that what I have is going to run out and I need to replenish. The deeper you go within yourself, the deeper you begin to function, the higher you begin to function, you realize your abundance step after step. Height after height, glory after glory, you begin to realize how much you have in an overabundance. At a kingly level, you realize you have enough to give and be happy about it, which is really the understanding of being a cheerful giver. It's not uh, giving your last dollar in church that you really need it. No, a cheerful giver, uh, the only people that can be cheerful givers is wealthy people. Other than that, it's not happy. It's not a good experience to give when you don't have. And that's the poverty trap. Give out of obligation. Give so that something can come to you. If you're giving, thinking about what's coming to you, you've already succumbed to the idea of lack, the frequency of lack, because you believe that you don't have enough. In reality, giving comes from a place of abundance where I realize my needs are met, my wants are here, my needs are here, I have enough to give and this will not affect me, therefore I can be happy about it. Well, even that state is lower than what I'm talking about in in rest, in faith, because it comes out of a state of love. The scriptures again tell us that we've not been given a spirit of fear, that would be lack, but of a sound mind and power and love. Well, it's perfect love that drives out all fear, and in the absence of fear, you find rest. So it's when you enter into this state of unconditional love for the world that you find the energy that requires no effort, only being. And in that state, all needs are met, all things are supplied for, and you realize you're not working, you're not casting, you're not decreeing, you're not declaring. What you need comes to you because you are now an entity that radiates that, that vibrates on that front. You attract that. Talk about the laws of vibration, the laws of attraction. You begin to function in a state of love. You drive out all fear within yourself, therefore locking yourself into a place of rest. 
which then solidifies you in an imperial level of authority. Which means that at that point, you're able to function in the emperor's demeanor. The spirit of the emperor, also known as the spirit of the Lord. Who is the one who taught me about all of this? <laughs> so I'm going to leave this here. Um, so thank you all. Please leave comments down below of things that you'd like for me to cover. In addition, I do have the School of the Empire that will be starting in March. The deadline to enroll will be March 1st. So I'd love to have you. Um, I plan on covering a ton of things and expounding on this topic and a lot more. Because this is just one part of, uh, let's just say, about four other. This is one of four things in a set of teachings um, that I will be covering during the School of the Empire. So that if you're interested in that, that school of the empire dot com, that'll give you access to my 13 week mentorship course um, that's beginning in March. Um, for those of you who are readers, I do have a book out fullness guide to sonship and mysticism. Um, it's a textbook. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, this will help you in that area. I talk about everything. <laughs> um if you're looking for a community, um, we do have a Discord server. Links to all of this is in the description down below. Y'all be blessed. Later.